Okay, welcome back. So this is part two of the almost ideal ranking cycle analysis. Uh, what we're going to do here for the uh, next part of the problem is work exactly the same problem that we did before with this change. We're going to increase the boiler pressure to 10 megapascals instead. So everything else is the same. It's just I'm going to change the pressure through the boiler to 10 megapascals instead of 8 megapascals. The steps in the process are exactly the same. So this would be a great exercise for you to go through that entire analysis, just like we did the last one, and compare your numbers against mine. Uh, on the website, there's a PDF of the entire problem done, and uh, some more specifics on those numbers are included there. So let's just do some of the highlights here. So P2 is 8 megapascals, now it's 10 megapascals. This changes the power into the pump a little bit. It makes it a little bit bigger, going across a bigger pressure difference now than before. It gets interesting when you start looking at the other components. The boiler uh, heat transfer rate goes down a little bit. So you're not putting as much heat transfer into the boiler as you were before. And the power out of the turbine goes up. So both the power out of the turbine goes, or changes, in this case goes up, but the heat transfer rate into the boiler goes down, although the pumping power did increase a little bit. So when you put all those things together and recalculate the efficiency, you find that the efficiency has also gone up. Okay, well, Not quite an entire percent, but uh, noticeably uh, bigger. Actually, for coal-fired power plants, or any power plant for that matter, small increases in efficiency like this make a huge difference when you consider the amount of power they're producing. The question naturally arises as to why the efficiency of the cycle increased by increasing the pressure in the boiler. This is a question that we're going to return to a little bit later in the course when we start doing what we call exergy analysis. So for right now, this is a little uh, teaser for things to come. So moving right along, uh, the last part of this problem asks us to once again uh, analyze the entire cycle, uh, but to include some isentropic efficiencies of both the pump and the turbine. The term adiabatic efficiency is often used. It's synonymous with isentropic efficiencies when applied to a pump and a turbine. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that analysis. Same thing as before, eta for the turbine 90%, eta for the pump 70%. There's our new TS diagram. Notice the things that are different. So 1 to 2 originally was straight up and down, same entropy at the inlet and exit of the pump. That has changed. State point 2 for real has the same pressure as before. It's still at the 10 megapascals, the pressure of the boiler. But notice that the actual state point lies to the right of the original state point. Also notice that I'm using a little uh, different notation. I'm saying the state point 2 directly above state point 1 is state point 2s, the s signifying that it has the same entropy as state point 1. The true state point 2 has a larger entropy than that. Likewise, for the turbine, the pressure difference across the real turbine is the same as for the isentropic or pretend turbine, uh, but the entropy at the exit of the turbine is bigger than the entropy at the exit of the ideal or isentropic turbine. Um, I'm also using dotted lines to connect the real state points instead of a solid line. The implication there is that the area underneath the curve on a TS diagram has something to do with heat transfer. If it's a reversible process, the pump and the turbine are not reversible, so the area under those curves do not correspond uh, to heat transfer rates. They're both still adiabatic devices, but now they're no longer isentropic. That's the significance of using the dotted line. So there's our new TS diagram. Let's analyze the cycle. Now, the steps in the process are a little bit different. I'm going to analyze the pump using... Uh, conservation of energy using the same system as before. It looks much the same, but there are some differences. So, you can go back and look at the last uh, part of this video to find that the pumping power in is m dot times h2 minus h1, or that the specific power is h2 minus h1, having divided through by m dot. And as before, I can find h1 because I know the inlet conditions of the pump, 10 kilopascals and a quality of zero.
I already have that number. Things change when I start thinking about what H2 is. H2 is a property of, or a function of two known properties of two, but only one of the properties is currently known. And that is what the pressure is at state point two. I have no idea what the second property is. Before I used the entropy being the same as state point one. The entropy is not the same as state point one for this real pump. So it looks like I'm stuck. I only have one property of two. I don't have enough to find what H2 is. That's where the isentropic efficiency comes into play. So the isentropic efficiency compares the performance of a, uh, an ideal pump to an actual pump. I know that number. I know that 70%. So the isentropic efficiency of pump is defined as the power that you put into an isentropic pump divided by the power that you put into a real pump. So ideal goes on top, real goes on bottom. The reason that is is because uh, the power into the uh, real pump is always going to be more than the power into the isentropic pump. In the real case, you're going to have to put more power in than the ideal case. So for power consuming devices, it makes sense to define an efficiency that way. If I divide by mass flow rate, I can put this in terms of little w's. And if I apply conservation of energy, I can find that uh, the little w's can be found in terms of enthalpies. Notice I'm using the same little notation here, subscript s to indicate isentropic. So H2s indicates that that's the enthalpy of the stuff leaving the pump, having the same entropy as the stuff coming in, and the same pressure as the real exit point. In this equation, notice that the unknown here is H2. Okay? Eta sub p is known. This can be found, that can be found, in fact that's already known, but the unknown is H2. So the most useful way to deal with this is just rearrange the pump efficiency equation and solve it for the real pumping power. So the isentropic power divided by the pump efficiency. Or H2S minus H2 one divided by the pump efficiency. Okay, so I'm almost there. To find numbers here, I next have to find what the isentropic enthalpy is at state point 2s. Turns out to be 201.8 minus, uh, or 201.8 kilojoules per kilogram. I already know H1 for real, and I divide that by 0.7, and I find that the power into uh, the pump is 14.39 kilowatts per kilogram per second, or, and uh, kilojoules per kilogram is 14.39 also. Let's take a moment uh, to look at that H2S calculation in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's uh, take a moment to go to uh, my favorite way of calculating properties at present, and that is to use this wonderful freely downloadable ease package that finds properties of anything I want based on two known properties. So the state point 2s, in order to find that number, what I'm going to put in are two properties. So the stuff is steam, that's already taken care of, and the two properties that I know are entropy, which is the same as state point 1, and if you go back in your notes, you'll find that the entropy of state point 1 is equal to point six four. 8, 9. So let's type that number in, 0.6489. And the other thing I know is the pressure at the exit of the pretend pump, which is 10 megapascals. Okay? That is 10,000 kilopascals. I tell it to calculate, and there's my property. So I have H is 201.8 kilojoules per kilogram. That's where I get the value for H2S. So the known properties are entropy, the same as state point one, and the pressure 10 megapascals. There you have it. So that gives me the power into the actual pump. The interesting thing about using isentropic efficiencies is that you often find the power first, and then you use conservation of energy backwards to find the actual uh, state point. So I can uh, use conservation energy, that's equation one from before, and I use that to find H2. So the actual H leaving the pump is the uh, specific power of the pump, plus H1. Plug and chug, and you get 206 
0.1 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so one thing that you don't want to mess up here is the confusion of these two state points. H2S and H2 have one thing in common. They're both at the same pressure. H2S is completely imaginary. H2 is the real state point. When we go on to the next piece of this problem, which is to calculate uh, the, con I'm sorry, the boiler Q dot, I have to be sure to use H2 and not H2S. Okay. All right. So when I do uh, that and I come to the next step, which is to take a look at the turbine, the turbine analysis is very similar to the pump analysis. So again, skipping some steps in between here and there, conservation energy is going to reduce to uh, the power and to the, or out of the turbine per unit mass flow rates, H3 minus H4. H3 is known in the problem statement. H4 is unknown. So as before, it looks like I'm stuck because all I have is the pressure at the eggs of the turbine, but I don't have a second property. That's where the isentropic efficiency of the turbine comes into play. So the isentropic efficiency of the turbine is the power out of the turbine divided by the power out of the isentropic uh, turbine. Notice that this is upside down compared to the isentropic efficiency of the pump. Why is that? Well, the pump and the turbine are different devices. The pump is designed to consume power, and ideally you consume a very little power to create uh, some desired effect. The turbine, on the other hand, is the opposite. It is designed to produce power, and a better turbine is one that produces a lot of power. So it doesn't take a whole bunch of imagination to realize that ideally you can get a lot more power out of a power-producing device uh, in, in the magic ideal world than you can in reality. So the efficiency to be less than one is the reciprocal of what it is for a pump. Okay. Um, my personal recommendation is not to memorize formulas for these efficiencies, but to think about what the efficiency physically means. And then you won't uh, have the mistake of getting uh, these things upside down. Okay. So as before, I can apply energy to the pretend turbine and the real turbine and put this in terms of enthalpies. Again, the unknown turns out to be the exit enthalpy, uh, whereas H4S is a property that I can look up in a similar manner as I did for the pump. Okay, so I'm going to solve that equation actually for power out of the turbine is the power into the isentropic turbine times the turbine efficiency or H3 minus H4S times turbine efficiency. And again, finding H4S is similar to finding H2S. Okay, so I'm going to leave those details to you to verify that that 2271 kilojoules per kilogram is the correct number for H4S. Um, so the power on the turbine is 1439 kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, so the analysis of the boiler and condenser are the same as the last example. I have new values because the H's have changed. Um, they're both a little bit different. And when I plug all these into my cycle efficiency, I actually see a big difference here. So plugging in those numbers, I find that the cycle efficiency has gone down significantly. It was almost 43% before, and now it's down to a little under 39%, significant decrease. And we see that this comes even though our efficiencies are not that bad. I mean, a turbine efficiency of 90%, you're thinking, well, that's pretty good. Um, pump efficiency, 70%, not that great. But 90% efficiency for a turbine, where you know, most of the uh, power is coming out, or all the power is coming out, doesn't seem like a big deal. But it is a pretty big deal. And what you find in practice is that turbines, in particular, are designed very, very well to have very high efficiencies. Because if those go down, the entire cycle efficiency suffers likewise. Imagine how terrible this efficiency would be if our turbine efficiency were only, say, 70% or maybe 65%. So a lot of engineering goes into making turbines and power uh, plants as efficient as uh, possible to really uh, boost that cycle efficiency. All right. Well, that's it. Enjoy.